may be seated. First Samuel chapter 30. We'll be there in a few moments from First Samuel in chapter 30. We come to the end of another year, and compared to the first of this year, where are you spiritually? I think that's a great question to ask ourselves this morning, where are we? It's easy to say as we day by day, Lord, uh, Pastor, I come to church, I read my Bible, I pray, and therefore I'm as spiritual as I was when I began the year. It's easy for us to compare our lives to to things that we do or don't do. But if we're guilty of that, then we're in a deeper spiritual hole than we could ever imagine. We use the term backsliding. Backsliding, the best definition I ever heard for that was giving up ground you once occupied for God. I think that can be true. Dictionary definition of the backsliding is one of the definitions to, to relapse into bad habits, sinful behavior, or undesirable actions. As we think about our text this morning from 1 Samuel in the 30th chapter, we read about David, and, and to see him in the condition that he's in is a question we ask ourselves, how could it ever be? How could he come to that point in his life spiritually? Backsliding does not suddenly happen to us. We don't wake up one morning and, and say, well, today I'm going to commit adultery, or today I'm going to steal, or today I'm going to, I'm going to lie, whatever the situation is, over a period of time, as it was in David's life. He became lax in his thought life and, and entertained fleshly desires. We can become lax in our, in our walking with the Lord, in our reading of the Scripture, and and maybe just trying to dive into the Scripture and making it part of our heart, or as the Scripture would say, to meditate upon the Word of God day and night. King David watched Bathsheba from the top of of, uh, his place to where she was uh, bathing, and soon it was the little step after little step and to give expression to the imagination that he had already born in his heart. I've said many times in the past, you cannot control the consequences of sin. And when we sin against God, it, it, it opens up the door, and we can't control it. It, it. We don't know what direction. We might think, well, just this little thing here. But before too long, because we become dull to it, numb to what sin can do, it spreads and spreads, and we cannot control the consequences. Now, your sin may not be adultery. Perhaps there's something in your life right now that, that you look at back and say, it's not real big, it's not all encompassing in my life but if if it's something that's not given over to God it's going to be the very thing that's going to destroy you because I say again no matter who you are you cannot control the consequences of sin that brings us to 1 Samuel chapter 30 for 16 months you know the story of David and how he as a teenage boy slew uh, Goliath and and Saul had taken him into his house and and uh, he was uh, an instrument player and, and uh, was soothed the, the heart and the mind of Saul. And, and uh, one day he's playing for, David's playing for Saul and Saul hears the women in the street saying that, David, that Saul had slain his thousands but David is tens of thousands. And from that day forward the scripture uses the term that Saul eyed David. And so he always kept an eye on what he was doing and and he, he, he always thought that David was trying to do something more than what David was doing. He was not interested in wrestling the kingdom from him. He was the anointed king of Israel. He left it in the hands of God. And that's borne out in the fact of how he protected Saul in, in the days ahead. But finally, he left the kingdom because Saul was after David. And David went down into, with, with Achish and, and uh, was there for from 16 months and lived with the Philistines. And then eventually came to a, a village called Ziglag. And eventually, the, uh, evidently, the Philistine king liked him because he was, he was giving him different positions of authority. And uh, it, it, he didn't realize that David was going out in various campaigns and he was attacking the Amalekite villages. And when the Philistines went to war, David was in the back of the line with his men. And uh, particularly when they went to war against the Israelites so he wouldn't have to slay any of them. But... But David, uh, uh, the king's men did not trust David, and 
David therefore was eventually exiled and he profaned uh, or, or proclaimed that he was insane and the Bible talks about the spittle on his beard and so forth and how could David come to that point in his life? I mean, everything seemed to be going well for him, and, and little did he realize what would happen in his absence, even during that 16-month period of time. It's highly significant to realize that during those 16 months that David never, we never have a, a record of his prayer time. We never, uh, we don't believe there was a psalm written during that time. At least it's not recorded for us in the scripture, but it was a time of spiritual compromise. It was a time that he walked really away from God where God was not priority in his life. So how could it be that the future king of Israel that was anointed by God, that was a man after God's own heart, how could it be that he could come to the place in which he came that was so destructive in his life? Let's look at our text this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there, and from small to great, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. That was David's city. David and his men were not there. The enemy came in and took the women and children and the possessions. So David, in verse 3, and his men came to the city. And there it was, burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now imagine the scene. There was this great weeping. Their families were gone. They were destroyed. They were devastated. David's two wives, Ahinoam and the Jezulitess and, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved and every man for his sons and his daughters. We're in there for just a moment. First of all, David had to face the truth. David had to face reality. It was all David's fault. It was David who entered the Philistine territory and took his men with him and, and uh, the, the mighty men of David. It was David who led the raiding parties. It was, it was David who exterminated people within the villages. It was David who, who uh, uh, lied to the Philistine king. It was David who, who left Ziglag defenseless. It was all David's fault. And so they were angry at, at, at David. No wonder they were. He was rejected by the Philistines. He had pl- it was plundered by the Amalekites. He was threatened by his own soldiers. And it was all his fault. He spent 16 months living in enemy territory, 16 months pretending to be loyal to the Philistines, 16 months he was ignoring his conscience, 16 months he was doing it his own way, 16 months he was away from God. But now he surveys with his men the smoking rooms of Ziglag. And he sees that it's completely destroyed, their families are gone, and the truth cannot be denied. David can't blame anyone but himself. No wonder the men wept. No wonder they thought about stoning David. There's an enormously important principle at stake here. God will not be ignored by his children. David was, God, God gave David 16 months. And during that 16-month period of time, David was in rebellion against God. And God wasn't first and foremost in his life. And sooner or later, God calls his children into account for their disobedience. No matter who they are, that happened to David. No Christian ever gets away with sin. David's fall has, has, has been great because he left God out of the equation. He was not doing what God wanted him to do. So would he continue to turn from God? Would he continue in his compromise? Or will he take the first step in the long road back to God? Of all the steps in our walk back to God, the first one is the most difficult. It's the hardest to take. Let me give you a quote someone had said some time ago. The truth will set you free, but it will hurt you first. And I think that's true. Because that we hear the truth of God, and God convicts us, and God challenges us. And we have to take that first step back, and it becomes very difficult. And until we're willing to face the truth about ourselves, until David was willing to face the truth about himself, What happened with Ziglag can happen in our own lives. Not only was it his fault, but it was the severe mercy of God that allowed David to go through what he went through in order to get him back in relationship with the Lord. So David had to face the truth. Let's look at the last part of verse 6. But David strengthened himself himself 
in the Lord his God. Second thing you need to understand about this is David had to remember who God is. David, it, it, that's exactly as it, is, as it is in the Hebrew. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Is that not a striking thought? That David strengthened himself in the Lord. Now he had to because there was nobody else. I mean, his, his men, his loyal men had turned on him, said we're going to stone him. His family was gone. There was nothing. He couldn't trust the Philistines, couldn't go back to Israel. There was no place for David to go, and the only place he could go was to God. What do you do when you reach the bottom of the pile? What do you do when there's no one around to help you? How do you strengthen yourself in the Lord? give you three ideas this morning first of all as I mentioned we need to remember who God is if we're in the midst of of loneliness and it seems like there's nobody there and we're all alone you need to remember who God is you need to remember his, his grace and all that is about God secondly you need to repeat the promises of God get into the word of God study the word of God see the promises that God gives to you as a New Testament believer Go through the New Testament. See the promises that God has for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Imagine that, what that must have done to David when he came to that tremendous truth because he did. Things changed in his life. And Then we need to meditate upon God's faithfulness in the past. Think about what God has done for you in your life, in your family. How God has been there for you. How God has protected you. How God has directed in your life. Meditate upon God's faithfulness in the past. Notice our text again. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. What a telling phrase that is. Very personal to David. See, it was not just a dry review of theology. It was not just an idea that I'm going to start going back of all these things that God told me, or, or what we would say today, quoting our memory verses and just one after another and not meditating upon what they mean. David had a personal relationship with the Lord. David reflected upon who God was, what God had done for him. He lifted his eyes and saw the ruins of Ziglag. He could not say, my city, my home, my possession, or even my wife, because they were gone. But he could say, my God. Now here's a powerful truth, and I want you to understand this. The Amalekites could take everything away from David except one thing. They could not take away his God. And anything that we encounter in our lives... Any difficulties that we go through, any hard times that we, that we endure in our own life, understand that nobody, nothing, Satan himself cannot take away your God from your heart. And that's a tremendous truth that we have, no matter where we are, no matter what our life may be, we can say, well, it, it, it's, it's always the Lord. God is always there, and he is, and that's the truth. Let me say it another way. I'll give you a quote from something I read some time ago. You'll never know if Jesus is all that you need until Jesus is all that you have. And when Jesus is all that you have, then and only then do you discover that Jesus is really all that you need. Think about that. I mean, when we're all alone, we, we, we don't realize sometime. We don't know that Jesus is really all that we need because in our society, in our structure, everything is seemingly fine until we realize that we're empty, we, we have nothing, and Jesus is all. When we, he's all that we have, we understand. He's all that we really need. And something like that happened to David. And David had been stripped of everything, of all human resources, and he'd learned to trust the Lord. There's no place like that but being with God. There's no place but understanding just exactly what God does for us and who he is in our life. Let me give you a quote by Corey Ten Boom. Reminding, and she's talking about God being good no matter what the circumstances are, and I give you a quote. Deep in our hearts, we believe in a good God. And yet how shallow is our understanding of his goodness? How often have I heard people say how good God is? We pray that it would not rain for our church picnic. And, it looks, it, it, and, it looks, and we look at the lovely weather and say, yes, God is good when he sends good weather. But God was also good when he allowed my sister Betsy to starve to death before my eyes in a German concentration camp, end quote. We look back and we say, oh, God's good. Yeah, God's good. And he is. But can we really say that from the depths of our heart where we're in the, in the, in the doldrums of life? And it seems that everything is gone. Do we really, can we really say how good God is? Yesterday at men's prayer breakfast, 
Daryl Bernick was giving the devotional and, and he was talking about a book by uh, Kevin DeYoung. And in the book he was, uh, was talking about, you know, and he made a statement that God didn't promise us a five-star hotel. And that, uh, that statement really stuck with me and I thought about that yesterday and again this morning and, and how in our country how selfish we've become and how isolated we've become. And if we don't have what the neighbor has or what our friends have or somebody else and we think we're missing out and and uh, we we in the, the luxuries of our life and we how we pray sometimes and how we look at things and and the poorest person in our congregation and really the poor the poor in our country in many parts of the world would be would be considered wealthy because they have a place to stay they have a have a roof over their head they have some type of covering or they have some place that they can know that they can find some help and so there are missions that are scattered around our country in many parts of the world you can't you don't have that and we get so isolated in our own little society, our own little being that we forget really the blessing of God and we forget that God is good to us. Even in the, in the difficult times, God is good to us. And we forget that. We forget how his grace is given to us. In the moment of diversity, it's then that the Christian's true resources are revealed. Third thing I want you to see, look, look at me in verse seven. David said to Avatar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring me the ephod here to, to me. And, and Abitar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Third thing I want you to see is David had to remember who he was. And that is, David was nothing. Here, was, here he was, the, the anointed king of Israel. And when it came to know the will of God, he calls the, the priest, he says, I need to inquire as they had with the ephod and so forth as they would ask God what he should do. And God said, I want you to pursue, and he did. You'll not lose your life, he said. As far as we know, this is the first time in 16 months that David had to ask, that he asked for God's guidance. And during his stay in the Philistine territory, he was living by his own ingenuity. He was, he was fending for himself. He was not dependent upon God as he ought to do. But now, when he was getting right with God, when he understand, understood who he was, it was then he was seeking the will of God. In the devotional yesterday, again, Darrell made the mention about how when he was at what, 10 years at State Farm, he had an opportunity to go place in Indiana and just praying about the will of God for his life. Now, now think about that. I was thinking about that a little later, later on in the day. If he would have taken, there were a lot of ramifications he went into and why God uh, allowed him not to take that. But I was, I was thinking about that. If he would have, and he would have gone, then, I mean, even in our moves, and you think about that with yourself, that if that would have happened, his oldest child, Brian, married Amy, who he met through the academy, they were uh, students together in, in school and married her. Two other children may not have gone to the colleges they went to. So a move was not just dependent upon what would happen to him, but upon his family and their children. Same thing with you in your life. I can think of people who have, who have gone, play, moved without really consulting God, and they wound up into a place where there was not a strong Bible-believing church. Oh, you could get saved there. They believed in that, but didn't really preach it, weren't strong in doctrine, and their families be destroyed. I could give you names of a couple of couples who are no longer together. They're divorced. They didn't consult God, and it came because of a move and things that happened where they were that affected the rest of their lives. So knowing the will of God and that's that was the problem with David he didn't know the will of God when, and he didn't follow the will of God when he was in Philistine territory for those 16 months but we can pray in, in our daily life knowing the will of God understanding the will of God and following the will of God and to do that we need to remember who we are that we're nothing that we have to be dependent upon God for God to direct us because right now today you are the sum total of every decision that you ever made in your life. And next year at this time, it will be the accumulation of the decisions that you've made this year. And every year of your life, and we're the sum total of what we are. And so we build upon that. So that's why it is important when we pray about our decisions, the things that we do, that we seek the mind of God. And what's difficult with that, 
And so many times we get our, our own personality involved and our own desires in there, and we try to interpret the will of God without really getting into the Word of God and letting God speak to us from His Word and showing us without any prejudice upon how we think God ought to respond. David had to remember who he was. Look in verse 9. So David went, and he and 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook of Bishor, and those who stayed were left behind. David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind, who were so weary they could not cross the brook Bishor. And, and then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and then they let him drink water, and they gave him a, a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins, so when he'd eaten, his strength came back, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. David said to him, to whom do you belong? Where are you from? He said, I'm a young man from Egypt, a servant of the Malachite, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion in the southern part of, Cher of the Cherites and, and the territory which belongs to Judah, in the southern, part, uh, southern area of Caleb, and, and we burned Ziglag with fire. And David said to him, can you, can you take me down to this troop? So he said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I'll take you down to this troop. And when it brought him down, there they were, spread out over all the land, eating and drinking, dancing, because they had great spoil, which he had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David attacked them from twilight till the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who rode camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried, carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, neither small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them, and David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and herds that he'd driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. Fourth thing I want you to remember, David had to remember his obligation. David was a warrior. He had defeated the enemy. He had recovered what was lost. And so off uh, defeating the Amalekites, David took 400 soldiers, 200 stood back, and they couldn't cross the brook. They were too tired, so David said, all right, you guys stay back, and you mind the camp. You take care of what's here so we don't have another attack. He found the enemy by surprise, and he humbled himself before God, had to admit he was wrong, hard for him to do, and he cries out to God, what do we do? And we find that God meets us where we are, and God gives us back what we've lost when we have a right relationship with him. David had to remember what his obligation was. He went back, took these men, and these four, the 400 with him, 200 after him, and went and, and recovered everything that was lost. Verse 21, David came to the 200 men that had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they had made to stay at the brook Beshur, and they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him, and when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we've recovered except for every man's wife and children, but they led them away and departed. We're not going to give them anything. He said, we'll give them their, their families back, but that's it. And David's godly answer, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who hath preserved us and delivered into our hands the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as your part, he is, he is to go uh, to battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share a light. Fifth thing I want you to remember, David had to remember others. Victory was won. 400 men came back. Some of the guys that were wicked, the Bible says, said let's give them, let's, their families not give them any, anything else. David said that's not the way we're going to do it. He realizes that every victory came from God. He said, this is the Lord's battle, and we need these people. They were doing a job while we were out in the battle. And David's gotten his heart right, doesn't want to mess things up by giving into selfish impulses, and he was remembering others. And then number six, look in verse 25. It says, so it was in the day forward that he made it a statute and ordinance for Israel this day. Now when David came to Ziglag, he sent some of the spoil of the elders of Judah, 
to his friends saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. Then he tells us who they were and where they're going. In the last part of verse 31, it says that David himself and his men were accustomed to robe. They gave to the people to whom they were accustomed to robe. David had to remember to fix broken relationships. When he got right with God, he said, I've been away for 16 months. I'm taking some of the spoil. Because remember, some of the spoil was from the raids upon the, the area of Judah. And he took it back and gave the spoils back to these people. David was repairing broken relationships. If we're going to get right with God, and we're going to be in right relationship with him, then we need to repair broken relationships. That doesn't mean, all right, I'll wait for the other person to come to me. Bible tells us you have a broken relationship, the responsibility is yours. And isn't it great when both realize their responsibility and take care of it and don't wait for the other person they meet right in the middle? And that's broken relationships repaired. All right, Pastor, what in the world can we learn from this passage of Scripture? Let me give you four things. First of all, make God personal in your life. That's what David had to do. Every believer struggles in that area. I, that's, that's what's so great about the Psalms. You read the Psalms and you read Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Why art thou disquieted within me, O my soul? He talks about his, the uh, pant is the, as the deer pants after the w- water brook. So pants my soul after you, O God. He said that great desire, and he was making God personal in his life. You get over to Psalm 73, and you read about uh, the, the believer saying, I look at the ungodly, and I see how they prosper, and God, I'm trying to give you everything, and I don't have what they have. And then he eventually goes down and says, it was not until I went into the sanctuary of my God that I learned therein. When I got right with you, when God became personal in his life, He said, everything started to gel. Everything I started to understand because God was personal to me. We read those psalms and we can relate. And somehow in our mind, God is out there. And we need to really bring him in here because that's where we can have that right relationship with him. Second thing I want you to see as our scripture and touched on it briefly, we encourage ourselves in the Lord. It's certain today that we're going to meet many trials in life. Many times we'll find no way to encourage ourselves because the circumstances are so grim, they're so difficult. In those dark moments, we need to turn our mind to God and just remember who he was and understand that God has given us promises and to know that he's been faithful to us in the past and so we can trust him. We know that he's there. We know that he's concerned about us. David said at one time, in the day of my trouble, I will call upon God. And may that be true in our life. If we put off repentance another day, you have one more day to repent of and one less day to repent in. That's why it's important to be right with God. Number three, repentance brings us into immediate fellowship with the Lord. Aren't you glad it doesn't take a series of classes in order to get right with God? Here was David that understood what his sin was and he got right with God and immediately things started to change in, in his life. And that gives hope to each of us. Charlotte Elliott's hymn, Just As I Am, the last verse says, Thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. God's given us a promise in his word. We follow the dictates of the word of God. Number four, when David, what David lost through sin was restored through grace. Aren't you glad that's true? We sang this morning, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. The Lord hath promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Through many dangers, toils, and snares have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me, lead me home. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The amazing grace of God. And we understand today that what David lost through sin was restored through grace. What you lose through sin is restored through grace. 
There's a town in Canada, Providence of Newfoundland, Western Labrador called uh, Waybosh. And uh, for years, there was no way in or out of the town except by air. And one time years ago, they built a road in the town. It was the only way in, but it was also the only way out. And there's a great truth there in our spiritual life. If you're going to be right with God, you retrace the steps that you've come. And so if we want to be right with God, then we need today to look to our own heart and say, Lord, as I examine my life today, I'm not as close to you as I was last year at this time. And then you examine yourself why, and you may not know all the reasons, but you can this very moment say, God, whatever it is, I want to be right with you. And from this time forward, you examine your life and the decisions that you make. You, you fill with prayer, and then you move on and say, God, I want your will in my life. What I do, I want my actions to reflect who you are. I want my life to reflect your grace. I want to be right with you. I want to honor you in the decisions in my life, in my family's life. I want to glorify you in what I do. And if we do that, it will be a start doesn't mean we're going to be perfect doesn't mean we'll never have a difficulty but it does mean that the grace of God is there even in those difficult times we know that his grace is present that's the amazing grace of God and may we have that may that reflection be in our life as we seek to honor him it's a road home for some it may be a long road home but take the first step that's the hardest you take that first step and then you honor God step by step that Jesus Christ might be exalted in your life.